Our first reading today is from a book about the Tao Te Ching. Thou, to sit, meditate. There is no fancy word for meditation. Although the ancients taught that meditation was essential, they simply called it sitting. They simply sat on the ground, not on the exalted furniture of civilization, but on the plain earth, which gives to us unreservedly. At the end of long days laboring in the fields or after a long day of walking in the mountains, the ancients sat alone and in quiet. They had endured the harshness of nature and also benefited from the abundance of nature. Rest was needed, but contemplation was also needed. It helped to absorb the passage of time. It helped to settle the turmoil of working. It helped to return to the silent purity that was the Tao. Even today, to sit and be still is all we need for meditation. Elaborate means have been developed, but that is because the psychology of civilized people has become complex. The ancients knew that meditation did not need to be complicated. That is why they didn't even bother to give it a special name. It was only sitting, as anyone does after a long day. In the end, we don't need anything more than to engage in the profundity of meditation. Tao is always here for us. It was never any different. We only need to take time to be silent and to realize it once again. The second reading is a short poem by Thich Nhat Hanh, Walking Meditation Poem. I take refuge in Mother Earth. Every breath, every step manifest our love. Every breath brings happiness. Every step brings happiness. I see the whole cosmos in the earth. It is an honor and a pleasure to be in here today. When Monica Stegeman invited me to speak, my first reaction, my first response was, of course. And I was delighted because as I've been a member here for eight years, I've never been asked to speak during the summer services. And I was very honored. And then I had months to prepare and think about it. And met, much of the preparation for me comes in the germinating of the seeds of what I'm going to do. And I was very grateful that this past week I was able to get up in front of my Toastmasters club, in other words, and do a dry run. And they gave me a very honest evaluation. <laughs> And I appreciated that because I went home and thought about it and said, I'm going to redo my whole talk. <laughs> but that was wonderful because I felt like I can do this. I can redo it. I slept on it. Images came up for me and I thought, this is all good. This is the way it should be. And if I didn't have a chance to rehearse it, in front of a group, I probably would have given you the other talk. So I think you're going to reap the benefits of my edited version of today's sermon. Listen, listen. This wonderful sound brings me back to my true home.
My talk today is going to be about my journey, my journey of transformation. And as you all have heard, the spiritual life is not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's about the journey starting here and ending up somewhere else. But then maybe not for long, because maybe your journey takes you on another route and you go somewhere else. And that has been my life. My life started as a Roman Catholic from the womb. Before I was even born, I was a Roman Catholic, born to two very Catholic, wonderful parents at the young, tender ages of 22 and 23. And so I started my life being baptized and then having all of my education, all of my education, grade school, high school, college and graduate school within Catholic institutions. And there's many things I'm grateful for about my Catholic roots because it gave me a sense of the transcendent. I've always been wanting to experience as above, so below. How can I experience that energy, that sense of spirit in my life? And so for many reasons, I'm grateful for my Catholic roots. There were some things I was taught in grade school that I accepted without question. And one of them is a doctrine that the Catholic Church teaches that there's no salvation outside the church. Did it bother me? It did. But I accepted it. And was I grateful I happened to be in the one true church? Because it meant I probably had a good chance of making it to heaven. I, go, I had a good chance of making it to that, the pearly gates up in the clouds with St. Peter and all the chorus of angels. I had a better shot than someone else. My neighbor Martha, my good friend, she was Lutheran. <laughs> oh. I prayed for her soul. I said, Martha, you've got to become Catholic so you can be saved, so you can go to heaven. And she was quite confused about that. But I accepted that. I just said, I have to be grateful for what I have. And I continued on to the point that truly, in the eighth grade, I knew I was going to be a nun. I even had my name. My name was Sister Mary Catherine. Now, my formal name is Kathleen, but I chose Catherine. And then we had to choose a patron saint. You had to choose a saint that you actually would pray to who would intercede for you to God, much like the Blessed Mary. So I looked at these St. Catherines and I chose one I thought probably not too many young girls chose to be their patron saint. And it was St. Catherine, Virgin Martyr. <laughs> At that point, at that young age, I did not even know what the word virgin meant. <laughs> but that's who I chose to be my patron saint. It's not surprising that a significant mentor in my life who really introduced me to Buddhism, to Taoism, to Thich Nhat Hanh, to Lama Surya Das, to Rumi, to Hafiz, to all these wonderful spiritual writers and authors and practitioners, was a Catholic nun. She was of the order of the Dominican order here in Grand Rapids at Marywood, although she worked as a pastoral care minister at St. Robert's in Ada. And her name was Sister Joanne Brown. She was a significant mentor in my life because she provided me spiritual direction. And I went on spiritual retreats with her for women. And we did some pretty incredible things at our women's retreat. We blessed the bread and wine. We had our own mass. We had our own sharing of the consecrated bread and wine. But she said, don't let the bishop or the pope know we did this. <laughs> and I said, your secret is safe with me. It was wonderful what we did. And so when I saw Sister Joanne for spiritual direction, because she introduced me to Buddhism, she did a guided imagery with me, with me sitting on the Buddha's lap. How awesome is 
that. And so I thought, if she, as a Dominican nun of 50 years, can introduce me to Buddhism, it certainly must be okay that maybe I still could get to heaven someday. But she changed my concept of God. I didn't see God as the man with the white beard in the sky. I didn't see God as male. I was seeing God more as female. I was seeing God more as me, the divine in me. And then I was seeing God in a whole new light, a whole new persona, and a whole new mystery. And so when I found Fountain Street Church, it was wonderful. I thought I came home. I actually came home again at Fountain Street Church. For years, though, I have a confession to make. I was a bedstand Buddhist. And what I mean by that, I had books upon books in my library, on my bookshelves, by my bed, of Buddhist, Buddhist materials, Taoism, and I never really established a meditation practice. I hate to say, I never did it. And what held me back? Well, I'm too tired, or maybe as I'm laying here falling asleep, I'll try to meditate, and basically I fell asleep, and I never really actually meditated. And was I afraid of something? Maybe I was afraid of those thoughts that keep coming in my head that I want to push away. So it wasn't until January of this year, January of this year, after all these years of seeing Sister Joanne since 1993, joining Fountain Street Church in 2004, that basically I made a commitment to meditation. And so every morning, almost every morning, if I don't make it every morning, I don't beat myself up. That's the other freeing thing. I gave up guilt. I gave up guilt for Lent and uh, the rest of my life. How freeing is that? It was wonderful. So I have a practice that I do every morning. I get up about a half hour earlier than normal, and I take my shower, I get dressed, I go downstairs, and I mindfully walk downstairs to my basement, which is like my little meditation haven, is what it is. And in the summertime, before I actually sit to meditate, what I do is, has anybody noticed it's, even though we need rain terribly, we have a lot of humidity in our house. I have a dehumidifier that pulls out a gallon every two hours. So what I do is I mindfully take the, um, the water that has been accumulated from the air, I transfer it into milk bottles, empty, cleaned out milk bottles, and I give it back to the earth when I actually water my plants. I water my plants, it goes back to the earth, then, then gets evaporated into the clouds, and then it ends up as rain someday that will fall back on the earth.